Good evening, and thank you for joining tonight's web seminar featuring Dr. Catherine Beavis. Your moderators for this evening are Peggy Albers, Dr. Peggy Albers and Dr. Dennis Odo, professors of language and literacy at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, and me, Christy Pace, language and literacy doc student at Georgia State University. We're joined by our GCLR research team, Tuba Angai Crowder, David Brown, me, Christy Pace, Aram Cho, Jihei Shin, Sarah Turnbull, Jin Jung, and Mandy Sinna, all doctoral students at Georgia State University. Global Conversations in Literacy Research consists of online interactive web seminars with the intent to circulate cutting-edge research in the fields of literacy and language arts. GCLR, as a research project, seeks volunteers for our study of critical literacy, professional development in online spaces. If you are willing to participate in a brief interview, please type your name into the chat box at the end of the presentation. The data collected will provide important information for understanding our research regarding web seminars and their impact on international literacy and discussion. During tonight's web seminar, if you have any comments or questions, please type them into the chat box. Dr. Odo will monitor that area, and Dr. Beavis will address these at the end of her presentation. Please help us honor our scholars' work by not replicating any of the slides. We would love to know from where you're participating in tonight's web seminar, so please use the STAR tool located to the immediate left of this slide and click your location on the map. If you're having trouble locating the STAR tool, a picture of it is located at the bottom of this slide. Wow, it looks like we have um, quite a few joining us from North America and to the rest of you from around the globe, thank you for joining us. We also are interested in how many GCLR web seminars you've attended. Please use the poll button as demonstrated in the screenshot on this slide to indicate your participation. Well, wow, it looks like we have a lot of return uh, visitors and attendees to the web seminars. We welcome those of you that this is your first time, and those of you who are returning, thank you for supporting uh, Global Conversations in Literacy Research, and we look forward to you attending more of our sessions. Tonight's seminar features Dr. Catherine Beavis, and addresses how video games have become a prominent feature of contemporary life and for many young people are an integral and important part of their everyday lives. Her presentation will outline some of the issues and questions that arise in relation to video games, learning and literacy, and describe some of the ways in which digital games are being integrated into teaching and learning in Australian schools. Currently, a professor in the School of Education and Professional Studies at Griffith University of Queensland, Australia, Dr. Beavis conducts research in the areas of English curriculum, pedagogy and assessment, digital culture and computer games, digital literacy and new literacies, and games-based learning. Most recently, she has published an article entitled Games as Text, Games as Action in the Journal of Adult and Literacy 
um, in the Journal of Adult and Adolescent Literacy. At this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Katherine Beavis and her presentation entitled Living in a Digital World, Literacy, Learning, and Video Games. Thank you, Dr. Beavis. Thank you too, Christy, and hello everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to um, be part of this great series. There's so much to say on this topic, and it's very hard to know where to focus, but I wanted to talk to you particularly about uh, video games in relation to uh, new forms of literacy and the ways in which they're uh, being used, or the ways in which people are exploring working with video games, or what we understand about um, young people's engagement with video games uh, in formal school context. So to start, we're very familiar by now with arguments about the significant place that digital games occupy within society, about their pervasiveness and influence, about how they outmatch sales of film and other forms of entertainment, and about how games and digital culture have become mainstream and an important part of young people's everyday lives. It's important to say at the outset, however, that this is not universally true and that there are large parts of the world where technological access and resources are far more limited and to remind ourselves that we're speaking of particular groups in society, albeit to a matter of degree. It's also the case that within countries such as Australia and more widely, a digital divide still exists. Access may be highly variable and in and of itself we know that access alone is not sufficient to provide equity. So, I'm conscious that the kinds of comments and observations I'll be making here do not apply universally. I should also say that I'm using the terms video games, computer games and digital games pretty much interchangeably to encompass games of many kinds played on a wide range of platforms including things also like phone games, CS games, um, Wii games and so on, as well as more formal computer games and video games. Digital culture is everywhere. As Marsh and Richard observe, in their homes and communities, children are immersed in media scapes of contemporary digital cultures, and their ruling passion, often related to particular media, characters, texts, and artifacts, seep into all aspects of their lives from a young age. And as Nixon noted in 2003, there are good reasons why we should attend to these kinds of things. She said, Computers and the new media are increasingly central to the lives of today's children and youth. Their participation in global media culture, including online culture, has become integrally bound up with children's and teenagers' affiliations, identities and pleasures. This kind of social participation is integrally bound up with the ways in which symbolic meanings are made, negotiated and contested, and is therefore of central concern to literacy research. Usage and purchasing statistics provide a broad brush picture of the take-up and inter integration of digital games in young people's lives. In Australia, the Industry Body Interactive Games and Education Entertainment Association, in conjunction with Bond University, publish regular snapshots of usage with a particular focus on the take-up of games across all age groups, attitudes towards games, and the place of games within families. Data is drawn from 1,220 Australian households occupied by about 3,500 individuals. The 2014 version found that in 2012, amongst other things, as I hope you can see on this slide, um, the average age of gamers in Australia is 33. Girls and women make up almost half the gaming population. 20% of this group is made up of people aged under 15, and that 98% of homes with children under the age of 18 have a device to turn computer games. By the time children are 11, 96%, almost the whole population of the age group of those in this survey, are spending at least some of their time playing games. And amongst very young children, while this might be a smaller proportion, 43%, um, by the time they're 6 to 10, 87% of that group are playing games. And by the time they're up to between 11 and 15, they're virtually all playing games for at least some of the time. Now this study doesn't give us um, a disaggregated picture of how much time is spent by different groups um, playing games. So to get some sense of this, um, we asked children in our current study, Serious Play, to tell us 
about um, the time they spent. There's about 400 children in this study, aged 8 to 14, and mostly they said they played sometimes or often. And we define sometimes as one to four hours a week and often as five to nine hours a week. Now, of course, what students tell you on a survey that they do during school may not be entirely um, gospel, but we think it's a pretty good um, um, indication that for most of these kids, they're playing games some of the time, but that it's not excessive or unreasonable. And that's consistent with uh, findings from a number of other studies as well. To get a more broadly based picture um, of online gameplay amongst uh, people in this age group, um, the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, provides this information that 90% of young people aged um, 5 to 14 um, accessed the internet uh, in, the, in this survey period in April two years ago. Um, and as you can see, that's a, a dramatic increase up from 2006. 96%, um, sorry, 79% of children aged 5 to 8 and 96% of children aged 9 to 11 and 98% of children aged 12 to 14 access the internet. And this was the case both for children living in the big major cities uh, and in very remote areas. Now, this is a very busy slide and I'm not sure how well you can see it, but um, this is for the whole Australian population. So you see there's that um, over in the top uh, corner that about, about two and a half, it involves about two and a half million children under the age of 14. Um, and it sets online and gameplay within a broader context of children's internet use. As you can see there, um, if you come down to uh, about the middle of the, of the page, you can see that playing online games, about um, one and a half million of those children have played online games during that period, and um, about the same number of children uh, in each of those three age groups. I think that this, this is this slide, this information is also very interesting in terms of the other kinds of activities um, that you can see uh, children are, are doing online. Um, you can see figures, for example, um, by age for visiting and using social network sites, uh, using chat rooms, forums and instant messaging, listening to music and downloading um, music and videos. A relatively small proportion of young people is engaged in making online content, as you can see down at line number 28, um, but by the same token, this is the most rapidly growing area in comparison to previous years. And these kinds of figures are consistent with studies that, we've, that we know from elsewhere, such as that documented by Ito and her colleagues, for example, in hanging out, messing, out, messing around and geeking out, um, in the documentation and theorization of participatory culture and its implications prepared by Jenkins and others, uh, and the patterns of participation evidence in studies such as the UK and EU series, um, EK or EU, EU children go online. Okay, um, this is an enchanting slide. This is from Assassin's Creed, uh, and I put it up for a number of reasons. But one of the main ones is that it seems to me that it's a particularly aesthetically pleasing slide. It's very um, narratively evocative, um, and it's an immensely it was an immensely popular game uh, when it was released. It was also a game that one of the girls in a um, study that we were doing, um, if you attend to a 15-year-old girl, wrote about extensively. But the main reason I put it up really is to, um, I, I guess, start to introduce this notion of intertextuality and multimodal forms of literacy. Central to the concept of multi literacies, digital literacies and new media is the view of literacy as design. G's work's been particularly helpful here in thinking about how this might work in the case of games. In games, learning about and coming to appreciate design and design principles is called to learn experience, he says, meaning a knowledge are built up through various modalities, images, text, symbols, interactions, abstract design, sound, etc., not just words. And learning about and coming to appreciate interrelations within and across multiple sign systems, images, words, actions, symbols, artifacts, etc., as a complex system is similarly core to the learning experience. G characterises games as semiotic domains, which I like to think of as little universes of meaning, where all elements have a part to play in constructing the knowledge domain. Managing gameplay also requires players to be reflective. As G says, learning involves active and critical thinking about the relationships of the semiotic domain being learned to other semiotic domains. 
and again, this is a slide um, that's, that's come from some past work we've done with kids. I particularly like it because, uh, partly because it, it, um, it's a nice example of the ways in which to, to, to read and to make sense of it, you need to pull all sorts of information from different quarters of the screen. I particularly like it because of the human um, alignment of the chaotic good, which I think is something that we'll um, to aspire to. Okay, um, so a crucial area in this kind of work is to recognise the central role of context, purpose, ownership, investment and identity in shaping the nature of play. Amongst other things, this means that playing games in school, enhancing games of school purposes, is inevitably different from playing games at home. Bringing popular culture texts into the classroom has many benefits, but it's also the case that doing so turns them into school texts uh, and business to some degree, not so much duplicating out of school experience as calling on it and hopefully making it available for study. In a number of research projects, I've been interested to explore um, what this might mean for contemporary English and literacy curriculum and pedagogy. There are, there are at least three foci here related to games and gameplay in and out of school. One, to do with the nature of young people's engagement with games in their leisure time and the implications of this experience for how they approach the kinds of texts they encounter in school and indeed the kinds of literacy um, and other communicative forms that they encounter. Second one is to think about games themselves, what kind of phenomena they are. How do they work as multimodal forms? How do they exemplify and embody multiliteracy? How do they tell stories? How do they engage readers and players? What kinds of literacy practices are entailed in folk reading or folk writing uh, and playing games? How do they sit alongside other forms of narrative and related forms? And where is meaning made? That question we ask all the time. Ranging from free space classic literature to a multimodal form. So, um, for a long time, my um, interest has been very much in the area of English and literacy and literary kinds of engagement with text. Um, more recently, we've also been looking at uh, learning in a range of subject areas um, and responding to the kind of uh, interest there is, I think, worldwide in exploring the capacity of games to support learning of many kinds. So working with games as text in the English classroom, um, in, a, in our series, in our a previous project, um, which is in the digital age of the 21st century, we're working with um, Claire Bradford, Joanna Mara, Chris Walsh, Tom Appley uh, and Amanda Gutierrez, we explored these very um, focused questions to do with English. Questions like what kinds of literacy and what kind of learning occurs, what kind of texts are games. A second question to do with how we understand texts and literacy, what they are and where the boundaries are. What does thinking about games as text and exploring textual dimensions of games with students as part of their work in English do to how we think about English as a school subject uh, and other areas of disciplinary knowledge? And how do we recognise the multifaceted nature of games as socially situated text and action, narrative and play? and what are the consequences of doing so. At that time I was very, um, uh, to think of games as text was an exciting and challenging way to understand them. Having worked through this project I'm a little uneasy um, thinking about games only as text because it seems to me that the, the combination of games as text and action means that they're very particular kinds of phenomenon and, and that the term text perhaps um, needs to be stretched a bit. The teachers with whom we worked in this project designed and taught some wonderful units over the three years, developing a range of classroom activities and wrestling through a number of questions about what to do, how to do this, why, whether it really was English or literacy or whatever, and a range of other practical challenges. At each of the five schools, teachers developed game-based projects as part of their English media drama or IT curriculum. And that book, that um, Digital Games Literacy in Action, that um, was on the front, um, is, is largely made up of, of uh, teachers writing about their work in this project um, with also some essays from uh, members of the academic project team. So uh, at one school, Melbourne High School, our units were taught around um, a serious game, the McDonald's game, um, a unit developed by a visiting student teacher, uh, the creation of game-based wiki where students were able to discuss and recommend games and create their own using simple available technologies such as PowerPoint. 
um, at the second school, second Melbourne High School, the teacher built his unit around the visiting game on exhibition, requiring his year seven reluctant learners to research and evaluate the games on display and to identify a number of key features to do with how they were structured and what they were in, what was entailed in play. They actually worked with them um, with Chris Walsh um, and used a, a modified version of um, the four resources model for, for reading, which you may know. At the uh, Melbourne Catholic School, one teacher, Joel, used the, the fantasy football game Supercoach to teach his Year 11 media studies students about convergence, while a second, Mark, with his Year 9 English class, looked at the younger boys playing the Simpson Tip and Run as a way of considering pitch intertextuality and marketing, and then used this game again in conjunction with stills from Grand Theft Auto, print newspapers and TV to explore representations of violence in different media forms. At the Country Catholic College, IT and English teacher John had his Year 7 students making Game Maker games, while elsewhere in the school, Belinda did to undertook workshops with her junior and Year 12 drama students around the theme of games. Um, and uh, Joan O'Mara, um, also a member of the project team, who I may have omitted to mention just now, um, worked very closely with Belinda doing that. Uh, and I should say that the book of um, uh, the digital game book Joe co-edited with me along with um, Lisa McNeish. And back in the Melbourne Independent School, Lisa, um, as part of a team of year nine English teachers, created a 10-week unit um, around myth and archetype and literature and games. So this is pretty exciting. Um, and helped us think further about games as text and the kind of text they were, <coughs> but also brought home very vividly questions about those aspects of games that fit less readily into textual literacy parameters. It's not so much that they were not textual forms, as that this was only part of the story. Games are quintessentially about action. Students need to do in order to play. Oops. Um, and one outcome of that study was the development of a model that considered games as both text and action, intended as a tool for mapping and describing game play and for curriculum play. Plan. We envisage this uh, as a kind of spinning pinwheel with overlapping sectors, but with any instance of gameplay likely to be calling on both layers simultaneously. As you can see in the action layer, we include a design situation and action, and in text, knowledge about games, nearest games player, the world around the game, and learning through games. More recently, in the Serious Play project, a group of us have been continuing this work, looking at games-based learning in the light of our previous study and considering a range of questions about learning and teaching, context and purpose, ownership and knowledge, literacy, pedagogy and curriculum. As with the previous project, the range of work undertaken by teachers varies hugely, depending on their subject areas, year levels, priorities and contexts. We're working with teachers in 10 schools across two states, comprised of elementary and secondary schools, state-funded schools, Catholic schools and other schools from the independent sector, and schools from urban and country areas. Students in our study range from very young, the first year in school, up to year nine with students where students are aged about 15. The student cohort mostly changed from year to year and the teacher cohort mostly stays the same. Where the previous project involved studying or working with games as text and the ways in which that might strengthen traditional and new uh, literacies, in our current project, research is organised around three kinds of games-based work undertaken. Um, by teachers acting as researchers in our schools. Um, so these three areas, studying games, making games, or using games to support learning in curriculum areas. And through these, we're looking closely. Um, and I'll come back a bit, here we go. So a focus on teachers, looking at things like um, the challenges they face in teaching within and around games, um, what they think works, how they think and feel about games, the kind of professional learning that supports them, uh, and their views um, on games over time. Now, focus on students. We're similarly looking at how students experience games, what they think games are good for, um, what they see as the challenges or promises of games, what they like, what games let them do, their own school experience of games, and um, part of that, I think, is to be alert to the very different kinds of um, the diversity of students in our schools. I guess. Um, and also the kinds of, um, I suppose, the, the, the insights and understandings that they bring or develop through that. Um, we've got a focus on in and out of school. That's um, trying to get a sense of um, 
what that dis what that disjunction is, or what the crossover is, or how there are, how teachers might um, respect and understand the out of school um, experiences of kids with games, um, and work with that in, in schools um, in ways that are not simply uh, attempting to duplicate. A focus on curriculum and learning, particularly what happens to the subject and what kind of things do students learn, and how does learning different. Um, a focus on games themselves. Um, not just which games, but what kinds of qualities of games, what games get brought into schools, how are they used, how do people find out about them, um, and how well are the affordances of games used, what kinds of learning do they prompt or facilitate. And finally, we have a focus on assessment, um, how to map and recognise the kinds of learning games made possible and the relationship of these learnings and expectations uh, to those spelled out in formal requirements. That's really kind of like about what to value and reward and how. So our research questions are things like this. How do students approach digital games based teaching in classrooms? What are the ways in which the experience of play changes in the classroom? How can teachers work with games most effectively? What kinds of pedagogical practices best capitalise on the capacity of games to teach? What are the opportunities provided for creativity, production and innovation? And how does learning through games challenge and extend multimodal literacy? <coughs> and I thought what I would do is talk to you about one particular um, um, work, you know, the work that I've been a bit involved in, mainly observing, um, in one of our uh, local high schools, to work with StateCraft X. StateCraft X um, <coughs> was developed to teach about core concepts in citizenship, uh, initially in Singapore, um, by Yan San Chi, um, a partner investigator um, and colleagues at the National Institute of Education in Singapore. It's a multiplayer game set in the fantasy kingdom of Bella and is played on iPods or iPhones. In terms of size, playing in the role of, as, as governors of one or more towns of one or four factions, players work through a series of challenges and scenarios <coughs> as they build up their own towns, conquer others and strengthen the, these in turn. Initially competing with each other to win the leadership of the kingdom, in the latter part of the game they must work together to defeat an external threat. In doing so, they need to manage their economies and citizenry, including trading with other towns and factions, building infrastructure such as hospitals and barracks, managing citizens' housing, training and employment together with their health and well-being, combat internal and external threats, build and use their defence forces and develop strong and stable societies. Their citizens are a mixed, a mixed bunch who must live together harmoniously. No one town has all of the resources required to function effectively, e.g. wood or um, gold or water or food, so trading is essential. Money is shared between faction members and cooperation and coordination between faction members is essential to ensure success. The game itself is played outside class time with teams working together or competing at home um, or it, in this instance um, in breaks at school for students who don't have broadband access. Okay. Um, a really important feature of this game is the emphasis on learning, uh, learning to be rather than learning about. Um, specifically designed to take advantage of new media, student experience and education in the age of new literacies, um, the game is based on a view of learning in which experience is central. Um, consistent with Shepard Squire Halverson, Halverson and G's observation that games <coughs> create new social and cultural worlds that help us learn by integrating thinking, social action and technology all in the service of doing things we care about, StateCraft X creates a world where students take on roles and responsibilities and follow these through with, with intensity. Unlike um, numerous educational games where the aim appears to be on doing school and acquiring content more effectively, in StateCraft X the focus um, is, is somewhat different. Cheese games seek to capitalise on the affordances and opportunities of massively multiplayer online games to bring about learning of this kind, to, develop the develop, to enable the development of insider insights and understandings of core processes and concepts at a deeper level. And his games are organised around the construct, of, the construct of performance, which he terms the performance play dialogue model. He cites Thomas and Brown's implicit plea for a shift in pedagogical practice to one that would better leverage the unique affordances of such online gaming environments that might better serve the needs of students today, and draws on Dewey, Mead and Bourdieu to reframe learning as a process of becoming. Uh, and I'll leave you to read that yourself.
Okay, so in this, identity is central. The narrative structure of the game and the ways in which players are positioned is invited in, and competitive, communicative, and collaborative aspects of the game um, all work to this end. So too do the circumstances under which the game is played. Echoing anywhere, anytime patterns of connectedness and play, as I've said, it plays, takes place, the gameplay itself takes place out of school time, unconstrained by formal parameters of classroom time frames, pedagogic structures and agendas, and in tune with when players have the leisure and desire to play. Students could play from home or anywhere where wireless access was possible, and the, service was, the server was on from 6.30 in the morning until 11pm at night. 30 minute breaks between terms provided time for the consequences of moves undertaken during play to become apparent and put into effect. So one of the things that um, I think is, is really important in this context is to is the very keen um, and clear way in which um, the importance of um, small, sharp and really identifiable pieces of information are uh, combined in quite complex ways. The students' experience of playing the game and the ways through which they played um, was centrally linked to the use of multimodal literacies and design knowledge. The game relies on textual forms that are small, readily recognisable and full of meaning. Further, it was essential that players had a shared understanding of what these symbols, icons and images referred to and meant, as meaning is built through players' interpretation and engagement with these forms of text. Reading and text are closely interrelated with this tight interrelationship integral to play. Textual elements gain in meaning through the practice of being read, and play takes place through a fluid and invisible exchange between symbols, actions and the broad truth of experience, expectations, paratextual understandings and more that characterise gameplay. As Chris notes, the logic of the screen is one where space and simultaneity prevail, unlike the page where the logic is one of sequence and time. Multiple semiotic systems provide economically coded information on the small screen. The game relies on the range of, of use of a range of symbol systems other than words to provide information in meaningful and recognisable ways. It presents a clear and economic rendition of the state of the town that's its focus, um, providing a detailed account of that moment in the overall state of play with implications for what's gone before and what comes after. And you can see across the top, for example, images functioning as symbols juxtaposed with numbers to indicate things like the town population, stocks of money, water, food and so on, um, items essential um, for, the, for the well-being of the citizens. Qualities and components represent of course the judgments to be made about the wide use of them to achieve social and political ends. The uh, stockpile of money is that shared by all members of the faction, um, something which is my downfall when I played this game. I thought it was mine to spend. <laughs> so there's a lot of, um, uh, it relies on teamwork and collaboration and uh, working across and between um, different screens and different um, uh, representations. Screens organised spatially with different information signals in different parts, the water path being erected and reflecting priorities in earlier decisions about expenditure. And the water tower huts, houses and other buildings are located in a schematic, schematic but aesthetically pleasing landscape completed with the grass and trees. And down the right hand side, um, a string of what looks like empty circles or buttons for spaces where a further set of icons, um, such as hearts or houses, also provide information to the player. On other screens, spaces, towns and landscape have their own images, patterns and relationships with rules govern, governing navigation, travel and arrival, the negotiation of entry, relationships of one town to another, uh, and so on. Okay, so as they played the game, um, students were engaged in a complex set of literacy practices, um, both individually and as faction members, reading the screens in front of them, juxtaposing information presented in highly abbreviated visually appealing forms, hypothesising about what might have happened since they last played, working out what to do next, and what the effect of the choices they make now might be. Multiple semiotic streams work simultaneously across physically diverse locations and networks in synchronous time, with a 30 minute time frame providing mandatory disciplinary parameters during which actions initiated during the previous turn take effect. The literacy practices required to play the game depend crucially on players' knowledge and capacity to read the multiple and changing patterns of symbol, number, image and so on. To these practices, these literacies and the design of the game coupled with the depth of investment players bring to their roles within the game, 
that enable the core tenets of citizenship education to be experienced firsthand. So as the game drew to a close, students and business actions reflected on their progress and what they'd had to do, what they'd learned and how they'd felt about it all. So this is Jim from the Phoenix faction. He said, it's a bit up and down in a lot of situations and times. We've had to go into debt, we've had high debt resources, but we've pulled through. I'm being able to get different resources rather than members of the group. And ask them for how. And he said, we do trading, send them, for example, 20 wood for 30 gold or something like that. Defend them if they're attacked by military forces. Um, you can send the military forces to defend them. And ask how well they're doing. I'm pretty sure they're coming second. And Mark says, yeah, we're doing pretty well compared to some other factions. Other factions have had people starve. And Jim says, we haven't had many people down like that. Some other factions have been attacked by the neighbouring kingdom. Something's coming and it's going to attack our kingdom and some people have lost quite a few towns from them. The relative success of Jim's faction is linked to the group's management of resources and trade and recognising the interrelationship of trade, income, defence and social well-being needed if the faction would survive. Managing resources was a challenge that students rapidly became aware of the needs, choices and interrelationships entailed. However, not everyone was so lucky. And you can see down here that while uh, Jim and um, Jim had uh, gemstones and could keep their citizens rich and therefore happy, um, Con had a different environment. It was a lot harder to keep everyone in my town happy, but I had other responsibilities because I was the only person in our section that began with wood who could actually build a wood mill. So I was having to build give wood to most of the people in my faction in order for them to build certain factories and resource industries. So I was very counted on in the beginning and then I'm not anymore. They built their own. The group members not only understood and correctly interpreted the shifting patterns of images, symbols and icons that emerged after each round of play and what this meant in relation to the power of individual faction members and towns, they also developed an understanding of how the whole faction was affected in a mindset that recognised the need to protect faction members uh, their towns and citizens as a whole. In doing so, they achieved some of the main aims Peter had for the, for the curriculum, which was to try to get his kids thinking at a higher level. He said, um, we should, they, they just think we should build the hospitals, we should build roads, and everybody should have, have access to computers. It's really hard for them to understand it's a resource-driven model. The um, winning faction, the Griffin faction, I won't um, spend much time on, but um, one of the reasons that they put down as their success was that they worked really, really well, um, had good communication, and they were friends outside of the game. And uh, that's uh, um, the, the uh, this, this girl here is the uh, the leader of the Griffin the Griffin faction which one the faction one which one. She took responsibility for overseeing the management of the resources of the team as a whole, creating a book where I put everyone's names. Um, she said, and where and we could see what they were spending, so they didn't go over a certain amount of money. So we still have enough money in case another nation attacked us. Other team members contacted her for advice about whether they could build, and um, she monitored who was playing as turns rolled around. She stayed up late at night, and she woke up early. She complained about how late she had to stay up and how early she had to get up, um, so she could stay ahead of the game. Her account foregrounds the ways in which on and offline literacies and literacy practices overlap and merge. The information is gathered and communicated in multimodal and in verbal ways um, through both the new technology of the iPhone, supplemented by the old technology of the book, uh, and by talk um, and writing and play. And then communication, as I said, was facilitated by off-game friendships. Okay. Um, so identification and investment in the game was the key element in developing greater insights into core issues and concepts. Um, for Jim, he said, another student, he said, it's different from just reading a book. It actually lets you immerse yourself in the game and into the more knowledge, and the more knowledge of the game that you've got, you're playing, it more engages your brain as to what you're doing. So what we took from this was that while traditional print literacies and resources are likely to continue for a long time, um, it's also clear, at least in the immediate future, it's also clear that multimodal digital literacies and the capacity of well-designed games in subject areas um, can enhance and deepen conceptual understanding. Students like Jim, Carolyn and Sam, at home in the digital world, had no trouble um, following the interwoven threads and relationships within the game presented in iconic multimodal form. The nature and affordances of online digital texts, literacies and technologies enabled high-level understandings to be gained. 
One of the things that I found particularly interesting in this is that um, while motivation, engagement and fun are the kinds of things that are most commonly touted um, in relation to the classroom use of games, um, it seems it was really more the capacities of the new forms of text and, the uh, and literacy, that is the multimodal, and the affordances of games themselves, that is the kinds of particular things that um, the way games work, I guess, um, and the opportunities they offer for personal investment and learning how to be would seem to offer the most in providing opportunities for students to gain sophisticated disciplinary and process knowledge in the in-school and out-school use of games. Um, I'm going to stop there because there's so much to say and I want to leave some space for time. But I would say that um, I think we've gone past the point where we, we're um, wondering whether um, games are, you know, do offer new forms of, of literacy and um, require kids to call on literacies in different kinds of ways. Um, and I also think that the current interest in working with games in schools is really important, but I also think it's really important that we um, understand um, in some detail what it is um, that makes them successful for students and what kinds of ways they can best support students and how we can best support teachers to, uh, to do this well. Thanks. I'll stop. Ah, oh, who's that teachers? Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Beavis. Um, we, you generated a lot of uh, just questions here, so I'll go through and I'll ask you a few uh, questions that your thought-provoking presentation generated. Um, I'd like to say also, uh, first off, apologies uh, to folks uh, who we, whose questions we won't be able to address. Um, if you'd like, you could uh, contact Dr. Beavis after the presentation if you'd like to follow up on the questions. So I'll begin with one from Regina Shearer. This is from earlier on in the presentation. And sh she asks, uh, considering the survey on how much, or sorry, on how many access the internet, what type of internet searches, and specifically, what literacy value was significant in their internet searches? Um, just to kind of follow up a little bit. So she asked, has there been any measurable means of determining the actual literacy benefit? Or is it simply accessing the internet at random? Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Regina. The, um, the data I showed you earlier on, um, the, uh, where, where that, uh, that took us to access the internet, is from um, an Australia wide um, study by the, or, or survey really, by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And it doesn't, um, one of the frustrating things about, there you go, no. Uh, one of the frustrating things about um, uh, survey data, statistics data, Bureau of Statistics data, is that it doesn't give you reasons for things. It just gives you numbers. So in relation to that, that the slide I think you were talking about, um, if I can go right back to it. No. That one. It's just figures. There's no reason, there's no talk. Um, so I think that's why it's important to do the more qualitative um, studies um, where we're working more closely with, with uh, teachers and kids to explore this kind of thing. And our previous study, um, Literacy in the Digital Age of the 21st Century, uh, and this one um, is looking at um, what kinds of literacy benefits there are. But there's two things to say about this. There's many things to say. But one thing I would say is that, of course, not all activity is equally um, stretching, stimulating, productive. Some, some accessing the internet, just like some anything else, um, may be fairly low level and repetitive and comfortable. Um, but it's and a related, but, but not all. Um, and a related question is, um, in terms of improving literacy, how we understand literacy and what um, what we take literacy to be. Uh, certainly for the teachers in our current study, um, the serious play teachers, where we're um, uh, working with games, a lot, a lot of it's sort of using games in subject areas, they have been mostly, um, have moved in their thinking from perhaps being a little sceptical 
uh, particularly some of the teachers who are newer to it, to being quite excited about the kinds of learning and interaction that students are doing around the games and the kinds of understandings they have. Um, but we haven't done before or after uh, literacy assessments in traditional terms. Great, thank you. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. Well, uh, I, maybe I can ask you, this one is kind of related, and it, it might just ask you to expand a little bit on the comment you just made. This is, this is actually a comment from Jennifer Nye. She says, this type of research is incredibly important to share with practicing teachers. I feel that many see games, in quotes, as having a negative connotation, yet the benefits can be profound in many instances. As a past yes. teacher and a parent, I find, however, that I have conflicting biases. I see the importance of utilizing this technology in the classroom, yet I'm constantly telling my kiddos, no more electronics. Any thought about that? Well, I think it's very familiar. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think, I'll just come back, I'll, come, I'll jump forward to my teachers, which I didn't get to show, um, the team. Um, I think that one of the things that I am particularly, um, I think is particularly important is that we don't see it in kind of either or terms and that um, we don't, I mean my, I would argue always um, for seeing games as part of a spectrum of text that goes right across. So that, that in terms of what we're studying at school, I think we should also, with our students um, in English, be also studying literary text. I think we should be doing poetry, I think we should be doing plays, I think we should be doing Shakespeare, I think we should be doing Greek literature. In fact, I think the whole curriculum should just be English, really. Um, so I, I think that um, sort of either or mentality is, is really pushed in the media, um, but I don't think um, it, it's like that or it needs to be like that. So um, I, I guess that the teachers that we've worked with, um, none of them I think feel that, feel that their students' lives are being taken over by games. Um, working with English literacy teachers, of course, they continue to value traditional forms of, of text and literacy, although they, they're, I think, probably some of them are doing it in different ways than, than I am doing it. For example, they might be where I would read a book, a print book, um, being of my generation, they may well read their books on um, e-readers or iPads um, and cross-check other things as they, as they go. Uh, but I think, I think a balance is really important. I, I don't think I don't. Th I think we need to think in terms of games and expansion rather than a, a replacement. Great, thank you. Um, the, the next question is kind of, I think, closely enough related to this theme, and this comes from L L L L. Sorry, L L S S Yasser, and he asks, uh, "What impact does gaming have on physical health of kids?" And he mentions in most digitized countries uh, are also already fighting uh, obesity issues. So what do you think about the relationship between um, encouraging online literacy and maybe some of these issues around health and obesity? Yeah, I, that's a terrific question. Um, and it's a question um, that I think probably has resonance um, in many parts of the world. Certainly in Australia there are concerns about um, obesity amongst the ch ch children's population as well as adults and generally. But it's also, I think, um, an instance where sometimes people put two and two together and make five. Um, there's in a, in a number of um, reviews, there's been a number of uh, wide-scale reviews of what the literature, into research, research literature into how games um, promote uh, learning in subject areas um, has been conducted. Um, there was a very large one um, my, called My Princesses in, Our Princesses in Another Castle by, by Young and colleagues um, that was published by the American Educational Research Association I think in 2012 um, and there's another one um, that, that was published by Parotta and Associates um, out of England I think last year. Now Young's uh, research when he looked at I can't remember how many hundreds of studies um, into games based learning actually found that one of, the, one of the areas where games actually were seen to make a difference across the various subject areas was actually a health and physical education. Um, and I'm assuming this is to do with things like dance games and, and movement games. So as far as formal curriculum goes, actually games appear to be um, promoting physical health and physical education in schools um, and, and it seemed to be very uh, productive in that way. Um, so I think, I think there's a bit of a media panic around 
sitting watching games makes you obese. Um, I think as with anything else, my, my personal view is as with anything else, you know, moderation is the key and balance all of those things that that um, we, we, we've uh, argued for ages. I, you know, I, I remember as a child being told by my mother, was I lying around reading a book again? I don't imagine I was particularly active, but it also doesn't appear to have been, um, you know, been an uncommon approach. So in, in, in a nutshell, I would say that um, I think common sense um, should, should um, Work if we're thinking about working with younger children, but there's there's not evidence that that correlates um, satisfactorily uh, gameplay with obesity. And as I say, in research um, such as Young's, in fact, there's there's some indication uh, to the opposite degree. Great. Um, okay, I think maybe I have one for uh, time for one more question, and this question is actually a little bit more um, autobiographical, and it's it's actually from one of our moderators, uh, Peggy Albers. And she asks about you personally. How often do you play video games? And are you a serious gamer? <laughs> and how did you get interested in this topic? Oh, this is very oh, well. Thank you, Peggy. It's a long story. Uh, <laughs> and the very short answer is, and I will probably at this point um, lose half of you, is I'm not a game player. Um, I got involved. I, I love. I love literature. I love story. I love narrative. I'm fascinated by the ways in which language works and the ways in which meaning is made. Um, and I became interested through seeing um, young people um, who, I, who I knew were lively, intelligent, thoughtful, active, interested, interesting kind of kids taking games very seriously. And I started looking at what they were doing. And this was way back, this was 20 years ago. This was kind of like you know, the original Prince of Persia. And I was really impressed with um, both the narratives that I was seeing in games um, and the kinds of um, the ways in which the, the multimodal literacies were so very evident. Um, in games, um, it seemed to me very exciting the ways in which games were positioning players, for example, um, all sorts of elements of, of uh, literary theory that that, that I was um, conscious of were, were, were present in games, and here were um, young people, children, really um, thinking and being challenged and stretched in in, in all sorts of, of, of fabulous ways. So. Um, I, I became fascinated, really, and um, I suppose I see myself more as an ethnographer than a player. Um, and I know that um, in the games um, studies field, that there's a very strong view that um, if you're playing, if you're a games researcher, you should play games. And um, I have immense respect for that position. And most of my colleagues play games, but but I don't. Well, let me say, when I try, I'm so bad at them, and I get so frustrated that I don't persist enough. Although I did, I did play right through the That's great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the presentation and the uh, thoughtful answers to the questions. I'm going to go ahead and hand you back to our host now and uh, say thanks very much once again. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Beavis. You've offered fascinating insight on today's literacy conversation and have given us much to consider in the realm of literacy education. Thank you for this. We would appreciate you taking a minute to type into the chat area one thought about this web seminar. Please help support the GCLR research team by taking the GCLR survey. The link is located on the home page of the LCLR website. Your participation enables us to understand online spaces for critical talk and discussions about literacy issues. Additionally, if you would be willing to participate in a 15 to 20 minute interview as part of the GCLR research study, please type your name and email address into the chat area, and someone from the research team will contact you within a week to schedule an interview. Please schedule future web seminars on your calendar. We have outstanding literacy scholars who will present on a wide range of research. As you know, these are open access web seminars, so please share our project with others whom you think would be interested. Please join us on April, in April as we conclude. Please join us in April as we conclude the 2013-2014 GCLR web seminar series with Brian Street. Access to archives 
of past UCLR web seminars is available at globalconversationsandliteracy.wordpress.com. On behalf of the entire GCLR research team and me, India Fraser, thank you all for sharing this hour with Dr. Katherine Beavis. GCLR truly appreciates your attendance, participation, and most importantly, your interest in these most important discussions about literacy. For those of you who wish to continue the conversation generated by Dr. Beavis's talk, please join the, the Twitter room, hashtag GCLR underscore GCU, following this presentation. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening or your day. ...and professional studies at Griffith University of Queensland, Australia, Dr. Beavis conducts research in the areas of English curriculum, pedagogy and assessment, digital culture and computer games, digital literacy and new literacies, and games-based learning. Most recently, she has published an article entitled Games as Text, Games as Action in the Journal of Adult and Literacy, um, in the Journal of Adult and Adolescent Literacy. At this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Katherine Beavis and her presentation entitled Living in a Digital World, Literacy, Learning, and Video Games. Thank you, Dr. Beavis. Thank you too, Christy, and hello everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to um, be part of this great series. There's so much to say on this topic, and it's very hard to know where to focus, but I wanted to talk to you. Location on the map. If you're having trouble locating the star tool, a picture of it is located at the bottom of this slide. Wow, it looks like we have um, quite a few joining us from North America and to the rest of you from around the globe, thank you for joining us. We also are interested in how many GCLR web seminars you've attended. Please use the poll button as demonstrated in the screenshot on this slide to indicate your participation. for our study of critical literacy, professional development in online spaces. If you are willing to participate in a brief interview, please type your name into the chat box at the end of the presentation. The data collected will provide important information for understanding our research regarding web seminars and their impact on international literacy and discussions. During tonight's web seminar, if you have any comments or questions, please type them into the chat box. Dr. Odo will monitor that area, and Dr. Beavis will address these at the end of her presentation. Please help us honor our scholars' work by not replicating any of the slides. We would love to know from where you're participating in tonight's web seminar, so please use the STAR tool located to the immediate left of this slide and click your Wow, it looks like we have a lot of return uh, visitors and attendees to the web seminars. We welcome those of you that this is your first time and those of you who are returning, thank you for supporting uh, Global Conversations in Literacy Research and we look forward to you attending more of our sessions. Tonight's seminar features Dr. Katherine Beavis and addresses how video games have become a prominent feature of contemporary life 
and for many young people are an integral and important part of their everyday lives. Her presentation will outline some of the issues and questions that arise in relation to video games, learning and literacy, and describe some of the ways in which digital games are being integrated into teaching and learning in Australian schools. Currently, a professor in the School of Education. Good evening, and thank you for joining tonight's web seminar featuring Dr. Catherine Beavis. Your moderators for this evening are Peggy Albers, Dr. Peggy Albers, and Dr. Dennis Odo, professors of language and literacy at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, and me, Christy Pace, language and literacy doc student at Georgia State University. We're joined by our GCLR research team, Tuba Angai Crowder, David Brown, me, Christy Pace, Aram Cho, Jihei Shin, Sarah Turnbull, Jin Jung, and Mandy Sinna, all doctoral students at Georgia State University. Global Conversations in Literacy Research consists of online interactive web seminars with the intent to circulate cutting-edge research in the fields of literacy and language arts. GCLR, as a research project, seeks volunteers